All right. Uh, greetings, everyone. Just a quick sound check. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Excellent. Excellent. Just what I want. Uh, well, greetings, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Brian Alexander. Um, I'm coming to you from Northeastern Virginia, right near uh, Washington, D.C. And I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, a particular issue which I think is enormous and of vital importance. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody for coming. I really appreciate your attention and your engagement. Uh, I think in many ways the gift of attention is one of the most precious gifts we can give people. Uh, Beth Gerstreeden, I'm glad to hear you're a neighbor. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I'd also like to give a special shout out to Olive Tree, who is an unbelievable mentor, uh, incredibly patient, incredibly resourceful, uh, very, very kind, just a terrific, terrific person. So thunderous applause for Olive Tree. Thank you very much. So, in order to begin, in order to describe, or to set the stage for this, let me just quickly introduce myself a bit so you can get a sense of who I am and why the heck I'm talking to you. Um, because if you don't know me, this might be a very strange thing to say. Um, my question that I'm opening with is, what does climate change mean for higher education? Now, in order to address that, let me just back up a little bit and explain a bit more about myself. Uh, I'm a futurist. I specialize in the future of higher education. Uh, to that end, I conduct a continuous research agenda, the process and results of which appear across social media, in interviews, in book chapters, uh, in articles, and a series of scholarly books, plus workshops and talks, sometimes in person, sometimes online, like this one. I also make videos based mostly on the weekly Future Transform live video discussion series, which is now somehow in its eighth year. And I also teach some classes at Georgetown University uh, in their Learning Design and Technology program, where uh, I'm also a senior scholar. Now, why talk about climate change? In my previous book, Academia Next, I explored the future of mostly American higher education, looking ahead about one generation. I also forecast the COVID pandemic, which won me some notoriety. After that book appeared, I started working on how colleges and universities worldwide might change over the rest of the 21st century. Throughout all the forces shaping that vast topic, from demographics to artificial intelligence, climate change loomed very large indeed. Yet I found scarcely any sign of this in higher education research, from scholarly materials to conference presentations. So I identified that as an area to explore. And the more I researched, the deeper and the more significant the topic became. This research grew into blog posts, articles, book chapters, interview videos, and my new book, Universities on Fire, which is shipping from Johns Hopkins University Press right now. So, what did I find? And by the way, as I go, I mentioned before that I'm really for me, people's attention, people's conversation is crucial. So I would just love to hear your questions and thoughts. Please, please put them up uh, in the chat. Uh, and at the end, I would love to also have uh, a chance to hear from you literally out loud. So please don't be shy about your questions or your comments. What I found was that global warming will impact global higher education for the rest of this century. That impact will be uneven depending on a given college or university's geographical location, the complex dynamics of Earth systems, the politics of a campus's local community, the politics of its region, and especially the choices of academics themselves, the faculty, staff, and students affiliated with each institution. Global warming will have multiple impacts across many axes of attack.
academic responses can also take place in several domains. This is not a simple but a complex dynamic that needs some serious unpacking. Uh, one caveat, for today I don't have time to go into the full science behind climate change. Uh, instead, um, what I would like to do is just remind you that there are tons and tons of resources online for that, um, and I'd be happy to recommend some uh, as we go. To begin with, various campuses are directly exposed to climate stresses. A good number of schools are located now on or near coastlines, which are vulnerable to increasing sea level rise, as well as to the infiltration of salt water into inland water tables, which has the power to really massively transform uh, local ecologies. Other institutions are located on or near deserts, many of which are likely to expand and to warm up. Other campuses live in areas where soaring wet bulb temperatures, and wet bulb temperatures, that's the combination of temperature and humidity, that can make life hazardous to humans. Some colleges and universities are in fire danger zones. Others will see their landscape dry out, becoming more arid as the years wear on. And some institutions will be subject to two or more of these stresses over the next 75 years. And that's the period of time that I'm looking at. Now, those are primary threats. Those are direct, and those are photogenic, and those are obvious and immediate. Mm -hmm. Secondary threats occur when climate change alters the biomes that campuses inhabit. Now, for example, rising temperatures can move animals to different areas or support new kinds of plants. And that not only literally changes the landscape, but these changes can also carry new forms for pandemics. The new bacteria, new viruses, which is why we have warnings about new pandemics caused by global warming. These natural changes can also alter the human communities they depend on for agricultural sectors, tourism, and these changes then impact their academic neighbors. On top of this is a third or tertiary level. Non-academic humans respond to the escalating crisis. Local and national politicians and bureaucrats, businesses, nonprofits, religions, and social movements, the manifold levels of culture all have the capacity to respond to climate change, and those changes then impinge on colleges and universities. Historically, societies have responded to climate change in many unjust ways, often shifting its burdens to populations marginalized by gender, race, class, religion, ethnicity, geography, and ideology. In fact, we are now struggling to cope with global warming in terms of climate justice. Now, this might seem too abstract, so let me make things concrete. Think of a campus's physical grounds, its lawns, foliage, buildings, parking lots, libraries, and sports fields. Imagine how fires, storms, floods, heat, disease, water, regulations, and changing social mores can reshape them. We can break things down even further. But let me just quickly pause and ask, uh, am I going too fast so far, too slow? How are you all doing with this so far? Okay, Molly, um, let me slow down, and I can come back and go over some of these points. Um, and I'm going to get really concrete right now, which might help. Uh, Beth, my apologies for having turned my back to the screen. Uh, I didn't mean that. Uh, see if that's better. Professor Graceful, Frankie, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thunder uh, says that uh, they're thinking of Coastal Carolina University in terms of what you're saying. Excellent. That's a great point. That's a great example. And there are quite a few of those. Uh, Molly, my, sorry I misunderstood. Happy to speak to you more quickly. Um, just let me know if I talk too quickly. So how do, we, what's the, how do we redesign our buildings to reduce their carbon footprint? Which building code should we use? Which material should we use? Should all, building camp should all campus buildings be net zero or even net negative, using various technologies to suck carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? How do we preserve historical and our expensive buildings? Now, how do we fund all of this? Because overhauling physical campus buildings is very, very complicated and expensive. 
Think too about transportation. Vehicles burning fossil fuels contribute actively to global warming, of course. When will campuses cease owning them and switch their fleets entirely to electric? Further, will we discourage or even prohibit people from driving them on our grounds? Think, for example, about encouraging more electric vehicles with more charging stations, or perhaps regulating fossil fuel burning vehicles to the margins of campuses, or fining people for uh, driving those? Think, too, about the electrical power needed to keep our laptops, lights, air conditioning, and water pumps running. Where do you presently source it? If you're purchasing power from burning coal or oil, how quickly can you resource to renewables? Bermuda College did this recently, resourcing to local hydropower stations. Or maybe you'll build power sources on campus, such as solar panels, wind turbines, hydro, or even geothermal, depending on your local conditions. Where is the political will for all of that on your institution? Further, consider the food that your dining halls and events serve. Meat and animal products make their own double contribution to climate change, emitting both carbon dioxide and methane in their production cycles. Will you reduce their presence on your institutional menus, shifting to more plant-based foods? I was talking to one California university which already shifted their cafeteria entirely to vegan foods. Now, it might be that the combination of environmental stresses will threaten to become too much for certain campuses as they look ahead. How many will decide that the prudent course of action will be to start planning on relocating to safer grounds, perhaps dozens or hundreds of miles away in another region? Now, that's a, there's a lot more to say about our physical campuses, and I'd be happy to say more. But I need to move on to the second major public, do, major academic domain. How does our research enterprise change in the long climate crisis? And Edith asks a great question, how do we get administrations to seek the need? Let me make sure that I can circle back to that, because that's a really good one. Now, first, it seems likely that nearly every academic discipline will conduct some climate research. Obviously, natural sciences are involved, from meteorology to oceanography, earth science, atmospheric science to chemistry. But we're also seeing social sciences research the topic. Some, economic, some economists are examining how we discount future climate impacts or how we might fund climate mitigation. In political science, there are projects addressing how climate action might reshape state power. Sociologists are looking at new social movements. Psychologists are wondering about changes to the human mind and personal development as the environmental world changes around us. In fact, there's this new term called solastalgia, which describes the sadness and pain of being able to no longer access the environment that one grew up with. Even my peers in the humanities are researching climate issues. Historians increasingly pay attention to the climate's role in past events. Religious scholars look into what happens when climate alters the physical conditions of holy sites, such as the drying up of sacred rivers like the Ganges in India, or when religious leaders, such as the current pope, take positions on the crisis. Philosophers examine the ethical dimensions of climate action. Scholars in the arts, in communication, in journalism, research how best to communicate climate information. Now, second, a lot of this work occurs within disciplines, but more of it also occurs across and between disciplines. Consider researching the potential impact of the climate crisis on a given city, say on the south shore of India uh, or on the north shore of Africa. Obviously, we need to bring in earth scientists, along with geologists, geographers, and other natural scientists. You might want urban studies and sociology in order to forecast how urban dwellers could respond, and so on. Bring in historians to see the recent history of this location. It's an open question if and when and how campuses will support such research. Perhaps we'll see more interdisciplinary centers start to appear. Now, third, some research materials face environmental threats. Think about cultural artifacts located in danger zones, archives in dangerously hot climates, underwater biomes studied by marine biologists, and those biomes are starting to mutate already. How do we support that work? 
Do we physically shelter materials, such as by building containment walls around them? Or do we move them to another location, which might harm their functionality? Or do we digitize them uh, in order to preserve them for the future? Now, fourth is the vexed question of academic travel. And believe me, this is now a third rail in academic discussions of climate change, perhaps the most controversial one that I've seen. It's clear that air travel burns a lot of carbon dioxide. It's also clear that unlike automobiles or ships, we don't have many good non-fossil fuel burning options right now, and few are on the immediate horizon. The logical conclusion is for us, for academics, to fly yet, yeah, to fly less. Yeah, that idea runs afoul of many academic attitudes. Our love of resources, our love of connecting with peers, our uh, enjoyment of seeing new sites, uh, the desire to immerse new professionals in their field, the necessity of being present with as yet undigitized materials. I just I brought this up at a, several different academic faculty um, communities online. Uh, I was called for raising the question not for urging people to do it, but just for asking it. I was referred to as a Trump supporter. I was called a, a fake academic. I was referred to as being actively anti-intellectual. It's definitely a charged topic. Now let me move on to the domain which many people see as the core of colleges and universities, teaching. The climate crisis starts off by potentially altering the curriculum. As the as our research transforms to conduct more climate work, we should expect teaching to follow. In some institutions, local, regional, or national pressure may be felt along those lines. That is, you may see state or city or regional governments or provincial governments or national governments encouraging more teaching along climate lines or the opposite. And students seem more likely to demand more climate change classes overall, all of which raises several key questions. First, how do we support faculty class development, i.e. when an interested instructor wants to incorporate more climate issues into their work, or a department or a school wants to expand its offerings? How do we fund that? How do we structure that? Second, how can we support interdisciplinary teaching, especially as most faculty receive rewards from work within their fields rather than across them? Third, which pedagogies best serve climate across the curriculum? Problem-based learning and inquiry-based learning, these are very popular in many related fields. We might see more of those, but that takes a lot of effort to support faculty in doing that. Simulations and games are terrific tools to help students understand complex dynamics, so we may see more use of that, which can run into resistance. Lastly, how do we align curriculum to support emerging green jobs and climate transformation careers? Let me just unpack that a little bit. Think about jobs that are emerging based on our transition. So think about installing solar panels. Think about supporting wind turbines. Think also about traditional jobs that will be more in demand. Electrical engineering right now is a crying need. But on top of this, what I hear from governments, what I hear from businesses, is that there are more and more de there's more and more demand for a climate change specialist. They pay gladly to have a student show who can just help them think about these problems. Now, climate change across the curriculum, the slogan I've been using is climate change may be the new liberal arts. Now, I've, I've been describing academic reactions in ways which might seem consensus-based or rationally driven, perhaps led by senior administration after a great deal of planning and deliberation. But that would be an incomplete picture. I'm, I'm setting aside right now active climate resistance and denial. What I'm thinking of is that we know that for the past few decades, climate change is immensely controversial, politically and culturally. And we should expect such controversy to take root within the groves of academe. For example, uh, last January, I met with several university presidents who told me that personally they were very concerned about climate change, but they made a point of saying nothing about it publicly because they didn't want to risk the political shortfalls of that. Think, too, about activism from younger students. And we know the generational differences on climate issues are stark. Generation Z is far more invested in global warming than their elders. Think that Greta Thunberg is now college age. 
recall too that some of the last generation of just stop oil activists the ones that were attacking european art displays those are some of those are college students now if student climate activism increases we might see a return to 1960s level of student unrest looking further ahead some of those students may return as staff and faculty members older faculty and staff may well join them imagine for example a protest of a faculty member who is a petroleum engineer now, petroleum engineering leads to very, very well-paid jobs, but think about them being condemned as traitors to the earth or criminals who are doing terrible things against the future of the human race. Imagine boycotts of cafeterias, which serve too much steak in their estimation. Think about the students, faculty, and staff protesting a colleague who issues a social media statement or publishes a paper that seems to support Exxon. I mean, we should start anticipating now a great deal of unrest. Uh, Beth Gerstraven points out that K-12 admin seems focused on avoiding as much controversy as possible. Yeah, you know, very similar attitude in uh, American higher ed. Now, climate politics will certainly extend off campus. A whole world of climate options unfolds between academic institutions and their immediate communities. There are many, many ways of thinking about this. In the United States, we often refer to town gallon relations. There are many opportunities for mutually productive work, from academics doing climate service learning and internships in the community. Think, for example, by having civil engineering professors advise on building seawalls or elevating buildings in the community. Think about electrical engineering professors helping with electrification. Um, but we also have the opportunities for friction especially given divergent climate attitudes. Uh, one university that I worked with had a consensus about siting some solar panels right off campus. They found some wasteland that was almost completely unused, uh, and they came up with a good plan to situate some solar panels there. People in the immediate community for about a mile around thought this was fine, but then a vocal contingent from elsewhere in the community opposed it and managed to block it. There's lots of opportunities for this kind of friction back and forth. Now, academics exist in the broader world as well. And this is, I, I think, the, the largest argument I want to put to you. Um, this is where the possibilities for the rest of the century just ramify and unfold. Think, how will colleges and universities participate in the broader transformation of civilization? Uh, think, for example, about one of the most controversial things in the world right now, geoengineering. Uh, that's the concept of using large-scale interventions into the Earth's system to reduce global warming. This can take many forms, from injecting oceans with iron or putting sulfur in the atmosphere, changing the albedo or the north or south pole, or orbiting sun-reducing shields or mirrors. Now, some academics right now conduct geoengineering research and development, while other academics right now criticize it. Think how that unfolds, especially as the crisis ratchets up. Will campuses endorse or prohibit such schemes? Will individual academics take public positions when companies, nonprofits, or governments pursue or block geoengineering? Alternatively, Consider the arguments raging now around new economic models. Some hold that we can blame climate change on neoliberalism and neoliberal capitalism to a substantial degree. And they ask us to consider political economies based on different growth principles, such as no growth, degrowth, or donut economics. So think if a given nation, if a region adopts such a such a policy, such a practice, what happens to growth-dependent colleges and universities in such societies? Should we, for example, turn down financial gifts towards new buildings? I've already heard of one university that just did this. Or will we have to somehow manage the feat of shrinking our footprint, shrinking our physical footprint, reducing the number of students we physically serve, while expanding our reach around the world? So, what does this mean for you in virtual worlds? Well, I have to say, just as a personal note, that I started looking into virtual worlds in the 1990s, back in the days of MUDs and MOOs. I built some stuff in Alpha Worlds. Uh, this is, I taught a, a, a blended uh, class, a, a high flux class using Alpha Worlds in the 1990s. Um, I did a lot of work in Second Life. I'm very familiar with all of this. So uh, forgive me if I talk too quickly here at this point. But think about, first of all, 
the huge power of your technologies and practices in support of climate activism, one of the leading powers of virtual worlds uh, and similar technologies is visualization, where you can help people visualize complex or challenging topics. Imagine, for example, being able to fling students into the heart of a hurricane or to go underwater and take a look at the impact of whale fall on algae. Imagine being able to have students handle physically uh, chemical processes. And there are all kinds of fantastic visualizations. Think, too, about uh, taking a location like this and making it more arid and more dry or taking a building and gradually more in border. There's a lot of power you have here in Second Life to do that. You also um, can have your social function work, where you can spread the word about academics and climate change. You can help form and grow communities. Now, we also have to bear in mind two possibilities for how colleges and universities will treat academic computing in a climate crisis. On the one hand, they might cut IT back, which sounds like a bad idea, but hang on a second. They might reduce the most computationally intensive parts, charging it with emitting excessive carbon dioxide. For example, imagine banning Bitcoin mining, because that uses a huge amount of electricity. Or perhaps banning the crunching of enormous data sets, which ditto, and that's what is the basis of large language models like the ones behind ChatGPT and other AI. Campuses facing financial stress, perhaps worsened or caused by climate, may also find cutting IT to be a politically easy target. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm just saying that this might be done. Think about what happens to virtual worlds in that situation. Will you be able to defend your usage of GPUs as well as CPUs in doing this? Can you say, for example, that this is a, it has a smaller carbon footprint? In fact, what is the carbon footprint of a given virtual world? Now, on the other hand, campuses might expand IT as they become more digital, as they seek to reduce physical travel. Now, COVID taught our whole sector how to work remotely. Uh, we experienced this most sharply three years ago in the spring of 2020. Uh, we can apply and upgrade these practices once more. In fact, if we reduce travel of all kinds, we might experience a virtual world renaissance backed by climate action. Now, additionally, I consider the rich imagination in virtual worlds to be a huge asset for academia's engagement with climate change. You have so many ideas and so much creativity to offer all of us. Now, creative educators will need to develop climate awareness and climate literacy, not just of the science and details of global warming, although those should be mandatory for anybody resident in the 21st century. We need to understand how humanity responds to the crisis. So we'll need to monitor the globe and see how individual nations, individual religions, individual polities respond. And then to track how our institutions change in response. That doesn't get a lot of excitement or a lot of traction right now. Just a couple of months ago, the University of Barcelona, the students went on strike and successfully won the right to have the administration require climate change classes of all students, undergrad and grad alike. We should expect to see more of these and we need to keep our eyes out for this. This will ultimately impact how we do our work and the form of our individual livelihoods. Now, overall, higher education will have to decide what role we want to play in the world crisis. And world crisis it is becoming. Think, we have the contentious redesign of our civilization's entire material basis. We have increased and more complex public health challenges. We have escalating weather challenges. We have threats to food supplies. And we think right now that one of the impacts of this terrible process that we're undergoing is acidification of the oceans. Imagine what happens if the supply of fish and other seafood starts to dry up. Imagine what happens if it becomes harder and harder to grow crops and to feed animals in major parts of the world. On top of this, we have a likelihood of millions, tens of millions of climate migrants. And on top of that, a truly epochal amount of human suffering and death. The question I ask is to what extent will academics commit ourselves to this world historical moment? 
What steps will we take across the domains that I've just sketched out? To what extent will individual academics, programs, departments, colleges, universities step back from the struggle? Will we act with an eye towards social justice or will we reproduce historical wrongs? I dread our many possible costs. I dread the likelihood of human suffering we are likely to endure. At the same time, I'm in awe of academia's potential contribution to the climate crisis. For our communities, colleges and universities might become great partners. For national governments and international organizations, academia can play a vital role in helping them become better informed, wiser, and more resilient. This might not be a gentle process. Higher education may have to shock the global system into resilience through our social connections and intellectual firepower. Yet it is too late for colleges and universities to begin preparations for our far off danger. The crisis is already upon us. We are advancing ruthlessly into the Anthropocene. Fires now burn on academia's horizon. It is up to us to choose if those will be flames of destruction or the lights of illumination. And with that, I'd like to pause and stop, and I'd like to hear your questions and to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to use the chat. I'd be happy to respond out loud and to read your words out loud. Um, or if you want to just turn on your own speaker, I'd like to literally hear your voices. Uh, in the chat, by the way, uh, LV mentioned the um, uh, Noah's sim that showed a tidal wave. Yeah, that's a great example of using uh, virtual worlds to show and make accessible really, really great, uh, 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 challenging issues and complexities. Uh, Beth Ghost Raven says that we need to cut down on standardized testing. Let me just actually mention a point about this. Uh, I haven't seen any people talking about this right now, but there's the argument which says that one explanation for how we got to climate change is a certain kind of hyper individualism. Uh, that is, you know, we see too much, we see ourselves as entirely economic animals, and those economic animals are isolated and individualistic. So we need to de individualize a bit. Okay, so just whatever you think about that argument, it, it's out there. So hang, hang on a second. How might that play a role in higher education? Well, it may play a role in grading and assessment. I mean, if we, right now, our assessment processes are hyper-individualized, that you, know, you have your permanent record and it's you as an individual. What if we do more group, group work, more group assessment, maybe form people into groups that move through their years of education? That might be one way to try to not just reflect a changed world or a changed understanding, but also to try to teach students how to not quite be so um, incredibly uh, uh, individualistic. Uh, Edith Halderman has a question. As a teacher of teachers in pre-K through 12, do you envision things that we can do in the pre-K through 12 world to work on this wicked problem? Absolutely, Edith. So let me just make a, a, a few comments about that. If we start off with thinking about higher education, think, start off thinking about college and universities, um, one of the ways this plays out is that we increasingly receive students from K through 12, as we always have, right? But those students are increasingly coming to us with climate awareness and climate activism. So already that's starting to shape and change us right now. But if we turn it around the other way, do we try and train teachers who will do more of this and in which ways? You know, the, the pedagogy I just mentioned, um, for example, thinking about preparing students to immerse themselves in the physical world around them, that kind of thing. Um, but I also, I think we have a huge political problem. Uh, I was in Texas a few months ago speaking to a bunch of public universities, and the public university administrators told me not to mention climate change because they were afraid that it was basically illegal to mention it um, in the state. No, I did mention it, um, I got away with it, um, but we should expect quite a few more, no, I'm not kidding, 
um, we should expect quite a few more um, situations like that. There's another example. I, I was asked to speak to a group of people doing education technology in East Asia, and they told me not to speak of climate change because it was, quote, too futuristic, unquote. And I point out to them that one of their member nations, Indonesia, had just moved its capital away from Jakarta because Jakarta was at sea level. Uh, and so the floods were starting to happen. Um, and I said, this is not futuristic. This is yesterday. You know, we're already doing this. Uh, so the political change, I think, the political challenges, I think, are, are live ones. And based on the way that we fund uh, K-12 education in the United States, that is to say, often very locally based, that politics may play out in some ways that are hard to, hard to predict or influence from uh, the teacher training point of view. Um, I think you're likely, you know, if there's a last note about this, I think you're likely to see uh, more and more examples of teachers coming to you with interest in this. More qu good question. Good question, Edith. More comments and more questions. Oh, here, by the way, I just, uh, I'll, I'll just go back so you can see, uh, uh, you can see the book here. Um, the more I dove into this, uh, the deeper and deeper the subject got, um, and I'm happy to speak more about, about other details or, uh, or other questions. Uh, this subject is it, really hard to fit into one book. I've already outlined in detail what uh, a sequel will be. Um, uh, a few folks have mentioned, uh, LV and, and Edith have mentioned for being in uh, grade school when they started talking about hydrocarbons. This is this is one of the interesting challenges. Um, is that you know climate activism really dates back to the 1980s in terms of the modern understanding of, of global warming. Um, it's taken a long time to build up consensus for it. So this is one of those uh, phenomena which are are slow moving um, and take a lot of time to build up. Uh, Eve adds, uh, guiding children to deeper, deeper critical thinking, problem solving, creativity. Um, we need more of that. Uh, we absolutely need more of that. And uh, it's easy to get people to agree on it, but it's harder to play out in practice. Um, I mean, one of the problems with critical thinking is that often you criticize people that don't want to be criticized, such as uh, teachers or principals or parents uh, or other kids. Um, but we have to risk that uh, because things are not going to get easier. Um, you mentioned problem solving. You know, just give a shout out to the uh, field of future problem solving. Um, that helped turn my head into futurist thinking back in high school, uh, which did a lot of really, really great work. Uh, Beth mentions it's clear that many adults don't have this ability. I th this is, I, I hate to say, here's a great opportunity, here's a great crisis. This means we have a lot of work to do, but we really do. Because one of the things that we can do is more public education. And this is, in the U.S. setting, this is weird because we invented the term public intellectual because we kind of, you know, excelled at the idea of keeping intellectuals from being in the public. So if they get out in public, you know, we have to give it a special name. Um, but we have a lot of faculty, staff, and students who take public roles through old-fashioned methods, being interviewed in broadcast media, uh, and newer models, uh, such as, you know, making videos on TikTok or on YouTube, and of course across all social, all social media. This is not without risk. Uh, people who do this work can get doxxed or harassed or attacked. There is a famous you know, flop of a scandal called Climate Gate, uh, where one university's um, uh, public emails were published uh, showing uh, the back, you know, the, the how the sausage gets made in, in climate science. Um, and it was a real big nothing because it, there was no surprises and it was mostly people talking about how to make data tables work and that kind of thing. But this can be a real challenge, especially when we have faculty who are not accessing, who don't have the shield of tenure. Uh, most faculty in the U.S., in fact, are not tenured. Um, and also we have staff uh, who are also similarly unshielded, not to mention students. Uh, so to the extent that we can do public work, this should be a great mission for us, but it's again not without challenges and problems. Let me ask all of you a question. Uh, I, I have a few of these just to, um, um, to, to think about this. What do you think are the possibilities for academic collaboration at scale about this? It, let, me, let me explain a bit. Um, 
we saw in the pandemic that we had some collaboration going on between nations and between academics, but actually not as much as there should have been. In fact, one of the interesting results of the pandemic was a kind of resurgence of nationalism. Uh, we had a lot of nations that created their own vaccines, Russia with its Sputnik vaccine, China with its own, Britain celebrating its own, the U.S. with its own, and so on. Uh, we had many, many uh, national systems and subnational ones where a lot of public health was actually going on. In the U.S., our public health strategy was a shambles, and our public health turned not to the state level, but really to the county and city level. Um, my question, I wonder, is how can we get academics to collaborate at scale about these issues? Right? Think about research projects, um, trying to research with faculty in uh, nations that are politically opposed to your own. Think about trying to form student groups across national boundaries or just across state boundaries or provincial boundaries. Uh, think about the possibility of a climate core, like the Peace Corps, where uh, you know young adults can perhaps get a chance to go out in the world and do practical stuff working on wind turbines or decarbonizing nations. Do you think this is something that higher education has the capacity to do? killed you all that question. Um, let me ask a different question then. Let me ask a different question. Um, what are some of the ways that we should change up teaching, uh, teaching and learning in order to address climate change? I, I think in many ways, you know, one of the, the kind of secret powers of higher education especially now in the 21st century where we have such large numbers of students compared to historical levels enrolled how much you know we get to train the next generation of not just leaders but citizens residents workers professionals of all kinds what are some of the ways that we can really change how we teach about this stuff in ways that help us fight the climate crisis See, thunder gave me a good smiley face, and that's a, that's appealing. I, while you're thinking about this, I you know, can tell one story. I've been developing a, a simulation game that simulates uh, a college or university. Students get to play different roles in the university. They get to play humanities faculty, science faculty, president, trustees, athletics directors, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and every turn is one academic year, and every year I give them a random event uh, to deal with, drawn from current events and from the history of academia. You know, a scandal involving a donation, a professor getting a Nobel Prize, changes to enrollment, that kind of thing. And it's very interesting just to see what happens as I sneak in more and more climate uh, issues. Uh, the students are really stunned by them and get very, very active immediately. Uh, Olive Tree, dear Olive Tree, um, says that virtual worlds and online games can help. It doesn't have to be direct in your face. If you could say a bit more about that, Olive Tree, do you mean working climate into other topics? Edith Halderman says that communication skills and research skills need to be taught absolutely. And this is where I give a shout out to the library world, um, because the library world can play a huge role in this by really helping students work on critical information literacy and digital literacy. You know, how to find, assess, and make use of materials in the digital world. And the communication skills, you know, one of the challenges of of course, is having to catch up from um, some of the de-skilling that went on during the pandemic. Um, but I think also as our society, at least in the U.S., gets more and more polarized, um, then we need to have more skills about being with people in society. <laughs> Uh, best gross driven issues of caution that if teachers have time to let librarians teach that yes um, we have to make sure that we are that uh, that teachers support librarians and give them space for that uh, thunder uh, comments that 
uh, they're retired, but when they taught second grade, we participated in Invent America, and students invented things to solve problems. If we did that now, we might suggest to look at climate change, we're looking for problems. That's great. What a great idea, Thunder. I'd love to see that. Um, I, I mentioned geoengineering. Imagine seeing some of those projects, or think about trying to come up with new inventions for travel. Edith was a K-12 librarian. You're a hero, Edith. That's awesome. K-12 librarians changed my life. Uh, for the better. And Beth Gessler, even excellent. There's a bunch of librarians here. Superb. Well, let me ask if we have a bunch of librarians here. What else can libraries do uh, to help us with this crisis? What are some of the roles that libraries can play? Beth Gustraven says libraries are all about information use. Right. Um, so uh, think about, um, again, when I mentioned digital literacy, Beth, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Uh, this becomes an issue as we get more and more problems with disinformation and misinformation. Uh, Frankie uh, Antonelli wonders if service learning offerings, which climate change advocacy and prevention is offered for students, faculty, and staff. Their contributions are by recognizing the course clarity or micro -preventions. Fantastic idea, Frankie. It would be great to see libraries do that, especially teaching climate change advocacy. I mean, so many students are so anxious about this. Giving them something they can actually do would be terrific. Uh, Thunder mentions that uh, loan instruments can measure and record data. Well, I mean, what kind of data? Do you mean uh, user data or content metadata? Uh, all three answers my question earlier. We don't have to mention climate change or crisis to get students to care about nature and the world around them. Quite true, quite true. Uh, so maybe just infusing more climate uh, content and more climate thinking into these other topics would be great. Uh, absolutely, Thunder. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the one of the fascinating challenges right now is um, trying for libraries to handle uh, the ebook ecosystem as publishers make it more and more complex. But also, libraries learning at everything from garden tools to seasonal affective disorder lights, um, and of course, you know, forming these community spaces. Um, so we should be really we should expect to see uh, more and more libraries serve as kind of gathering notes uh, for all of this. All right. Oh, absolutely. The technology, um, GoPro cameras, drones, whatever you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be interesting uh, to think about what climate-specific technologies we can loan out. Uh, my local library loans out a whole intro gardening kit, uh, complete with a digging tool, a bunch of seeds, um, protective gear, uh, guidebook, and everything else. Uh, imagine having uh, decarbonization kits that could be loaned out. Uh, imagine um, libraries partnering uh, to help bring solar power to different people. It would be great to see more of that. Excellent. Well, let me wrap things up. Um, I'm making, uh, in my futurist work, um, I think it's kind of malpractice not to draw climate change into that no matter what future you're looking at, because the subject is that huge and that complex. Uh, I've been doing this across a few different domains. I've been holding live video conveners about this. Uh, I've been doing workshops. Uh, I'm launching a whole series of in-person and online workshops and speeches, trying to stir the pot, trying to get people excited about climate change in academia. Um, I would love to hear more of your thoughts. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm very easy to find. I'm all over the web, all over social media. I'm really grateful to all of you for coming to, on this journey with me over this past hour. I'm really grateful to you all for the opportunity to work with all of you. Um, I'm really especially grateful to Olive, uh, Olive Tree for all of her great work in making sure I got to this point. Um, thank you all. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the time that you have today. And please reach out to me with any questions. Thank you so much.